Hi everyone, uh, welcome to HPS 200 Science and Values. Uh, so this video is going to be a kind of course overview, an overview of the big ideas that I'll present. There's another video for this week that goes over the syllabus in detail, so please do check that out as well for information about the assignments, the readings, the tutorials, and so on. For now, uh, I'd like to just introduce what I'm going to talk about, which is broadly the relationship between science and values. And the very claim that there is such a relationship might strike you as controversial. It strikes lots of people as controversial. So there's a big debate in philosophy of science about if there's a relationship here, and if so, what it is. Uh, what I'd like to offer you in this course is a kind of argument. So throughout, especially the first half of the course, I'm going to present to you an argument that, in fact, science and values do interact in important ways. And that might sound a little worrying if your idea of science is something that's purely objective. That is something that isn't influenced by human emotion, human feelings, or human values in any important way. Uh, so you might have heard a popular internet celebrity say something like, facts don't care about your feelings. And in some broad sense, that's got to be right. I mean, facts are not things that care about anything, actually. They're just sort of objective in the world things. Uh, but the spirit of the idea is, of course, that there are objective facts, and those objective facts are not related in any important way to, for example, what you think, what you feel is important. Right? So considering something important, I think in a broad sense, is like a feeling or emotional state. It's not an objective fact. So the fact that some, the idea that something is important isn't out there in the world, it's a human subjective state. And what I'm gonna make the case for is the idea that these values actually do play a crucial role in the process of science. Um, specifically, you know, the, the assigning importance to something is actually turns out to be, when you look carefully at the process of doing science, a crucial part of the, of the story. So I'm going to make this case. I'm at least partly going to be relying on the argument from Frederick Grinnell. So this is uh, the main reading from September to, I think, mid-October, the first four weeks. So there's no reading for this first week. Uh, week two, we're going to start reading this book, The Everyday Practice of Science by Frederick Grinnell. Uh, subtitle, Where Intuition and Passion Meet Objectivity and Logic. So intuition and passion have this sort of subjective feel, and you might be used to the idea that science is all about objective facts. But Grinnell is going to make the case that intuition and passion, uh, caring about things, and what he'll talk about is noticing things, are actually central aspects of the scientific process. Now, I chose this uh, book at least partly because many of the people taking this course are science students. And Grinnell himself is a scientist, so he's in biology. So he's writing from the perspective of a working scientist. Uh, he's not a philosopher, so he's not going to throw a bunch of unexplained philosophical jargon at you. Uh, he's going to make the case that if you know what it's like to be a working scientist, then you'll see that intuition, passion, that is values, have an important role to play in the best science. So in really good science, not in sort of like substandard science, but in the really best of the best, intuition and passion have a crucial role to play. So uh, the book is on, all of the readings are up on Quirkus now in the form of PDFs. So you don't have to buy anything, go on Quirkus and they'll be under each week, uh, the relevant reading that you can download. So check this out. Uh, if you can, I do recommend buying a copy. It's not super. It's not a super expensive book. You can get it on your online, your favorite online booksellers. It would be nice to have something physical to hold on to, as this course is uh, online and a bit. It'll feel a bit abstract, probably. So buy it if you're if you're able. Okay. So Grinnell's going to make this case that values have a really important role to play particularly in the cutting edge of science. So he's going he's gonna to talk about how we do science on the cutting edge. And he's going to try to convince us to stop thinking about science in 
this way. So here's an image of what's what we sometimes call the scientific method. Uh, this is something that you're probably familiar with if you did a, a science fair in elementary or high school. Uh, it goes, one, question, pick something you're curious about. Two, hypothesis, make an educated guess. Three, do an experiment. Four, record your data. Five, analyze that data. And six, do a report. So this is a kind of ultra simplified version of the scientific method that's reflected in the way people write journal articles, research reports, posters, conference presentations, so the sort of way science is reported. But Grinnell's gonna to try to convince us that this is a deeply confused picture of how science actually works. So it's how we report the results of scientific studies. But he's gonna make the case that if you think this is how science actually works, you're missing out on some of the really important complexities and subtleties of the process. Uh, and we've essentially simplified away the parts of the process that make values important. So he's gonna to try to convince us that this is not how science actually works. Um, this is how science would work if we already knew what the right questions to ask are, how to find the answers to those questions, and how to analyze the results of our uh, fact-finding process. But on the cutting edge of science, you don't know any of those things. So when you're doing new science, what you're doing is trying to push back the boundaries of our ignorance. So you don't know what the right question to ask is or what the answer is going to look like. So with the complexity of working, as it were, in the dark on the cutting edge of science, this model is gonna turn out to be pretty inadequate. So that's the, that's the kind of main idea that Grinnell's gonna try to convey to us. I'm gonna uh, follow along with him, present some of my own arguments to the same effect and connect it to values as, a, as an idea. Okay. And one of the central things that Grinnell is going to sort of hinge his case on, the idea that what science crucially involves is noticing. And noticing things is mostly unconscious. You mostly do it without even being aware that you're sort of doing work to notice things, but it actually turns out to be a really subtle skill. Noticing turns out to be something very hard to do in a very skillful way. So for example, consider the image that I've got up on here. So do you notice anything about this image? So there's three playing cards. If you glance at them quickly, they look pretty normal, but take a second, if, you, if you're not just listening to this, but you can see the video, Take a second to see if you notice anything odd about them. Um, now, I've given you a clue here. So I haven't just sort of let you go at this without any guidance. I've told you that there is something odd about these playing cards. So I've already helped you along in the process of noticing. But for a lot of people, it still takes a couple seconds or even a couple minutes to s notice that there's something weird about one of these. It's the four, the four of hearts. Hearts are usually a red card, right? So what your brain did for you, probably if you were chugging along in your normal mode, is just present you these as objects, sort of uh, well unified, coherent objects. You go, yeah, 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 five of spades, nine of hearts, four of hearts, no problem. Or maybe your brain went four of spades. It didn't even pick up on the idea that there's something funny going on here. So this is actually from a psychology paper on noticing and what it takes to notice deeply. So this is a kind of toy example. When you're doing science on the cutting edge, the noticing is actually much harder than this. So noticing what's important, as it were, turns out to be a very subtle skill. And noticing, I'm gonna make the case, so I'm gonna make a case from cognitive psychology, noticing, is a way of assigning value. It's a way of assigning importance to various aspects of things. So if you're like most people, when your eyes passed over that four of hearts, you didn't assign much importance to the relationship between the shape and the color because that's something that's been so consistent in your experience that you don't even really need to worry about it. So worrying about something is a way of assigning importance or value to something. So Noticing, in this case, turns out to be, noticing well, 
turns out to be a question of what your brain is willing to spend time and energy on. It's in some sense an economic question for your cognition. So that's the way I want you to think about values in this course. So it's very easy to think of values as being in some sense the opposite of reason. Uh, this is something that we get from the kind of romantic era where there is cold, hard logic on the one hand and flighty, humane emotions on the other. And to the extent that you're having values or that you're feeling anything, you're not being as rational. But what I'd like to make the case for is a picture of rationality that's sort of emerging from cognitive science, cognitive psychology, where values and reason are not really that separate. Actually, to be a good reasoner, you need to have a value structure. And the value structure that you use is going to affect the way that you reason, precisely because of these resource allocation problems. So there's just way too much in the world to pay attention to at all. You've got to selectively allocate your attention. And that means, and what you do, the way that you do that is by having stuff that you care about. You care about this rather than that, and you're going to allocate your attention based on what you care about. So caring about the world and reasoning about the world turn out to be very deeply related activities that we can't pull apart. Anyway, that's the case I'm going to make for you. I'm going to make an argument over the next month, month and a half that this is the case. So... Uh, in scientific research, especially, so this is, I think this is a general fact about cognition. In scientific research specifically, it's a very tricky question to know where to allocate our resources. There's constantly less funding, human power, uh, resources available for research projects than, than we want. So we have to make these choices, and those choices are going to be driven by what we care about. Okay, so... That's the main idea that Grinnell's gonna develop and I'm gonna develop with him over the first three chapters. So the first three readings, week two, three, and four. Uh, and then he's gonna go on to talk about scientific integrity where actually, value, so values can have a negative effect on science as well. I've been just sort of describing the, the argument that I'm gonna make that values are a crucial part of even very good science. Then we're gonna start talking about ways in which values can actually be a problem for science. So if you've got perverse incentive structures, you might say, think ways of valuing things that don't help with the scientific process. You can get bad results. So both for good and for bad, values have a, play to, a role to play in science. Um, so we'll move on then to talk a little bit about ideology. Uh, this is a, a $5 word, as my father used to say, uh, but it just means... Uh, you know, the, back, the kind of background assumptions that you make when you approach the world. So an ideology in some sense is the invisible background assumptions. You might think of the famous quotation that I couldn't find a source for, which is, whoever discovered water, it wasn't a fish, right? So ideology are the kind of beliefs that we swim through without even noticing them. Uh, we'll read a couple of chapters from Richard Lewinson's book, Biology as Ideology, where we'll try to uh, he, Lewinton is going to try to pull out some of the ways in which our unconscious background assumptions can actually affect the way that scientific research goes. And that can be a genuine problem. So if we're not sensitive to the ways that we're making assumptions, they can color our research in ways that limits us. So another goal of this course is to try to help sensitize you to these background assumptions that we all make all the time. You have to have these background assumptions. There's just too much of the world to deal with without sort of assuming things most of the time or even all the time. But that doesn't mean that you can't become sensitive to them, pay attention to them, learn to dig them up and interrogate them. So learning to do that is another one of the goals of this course. Uh, we'll move on to a case, another case study, again, within biology of this sort of thing, where uh, we'll read a couple chapters from Elizabeth Lloyd's book, The Case of the Female Orgasm, Bias in the Science of Evolution. So she's going to make the case by looking at a bunch of theories of the evolution of the human female orgasm, uh, that there's genuine bias in evolutionary biology based on background assumptions that people make about sex and gender. So she's going to interrogate a bunch of theories about 
how the female orgasm evolved the properties that it has. And her diagnosis is science is being hindered by these ideological assumptions. And hopefully if we can identify, her goal is if we can identify these background assumptions and criticize them, we can do better science. We can get out from under the biases that are uh, holding us back. We'll then go on to talk a little bit about human nature, sort of more generally. So uh, very biologically focused part of this, but I think biology is one of the most interesting places to talk about these invisible background assumptions because we're living things, we're human beings. So it's easy for us to think we know a lot about this. I don't have a lot of invisible background assumptions I think about supernovas or tectonic plates or chemical reactions because I really don't know anything about those. Well, I don't have the kind of intimate personal knowledge of those things that uh, would make me uh, sort of convinced that I already know what I'm talking about. Whereas when we're talking about living things, when we're talking about humans, we're all intimately familiar with our own humanity and therefore it's easy for us to make the assumption that you know we know already what we're looking at. So we'll talk a little bit about human nature as an idea. Uh, we'll read a paper by Tim Lewins, which uh, he's going to argue that human nature is a kind of, the idea, the very idea of human nature is a kind of mistake. That we've got this confused notion that's hindering our ability to think about ourselves. So we'll do that. And then we'll go through another, so the end of the course is less focused on biology. We'll just go through a number of case studies of places where I think uh, science and values interact in an interesting way, but uh, more in the way that we're trying to interrogate what we should be doing with science, rather than influence the, uh, in looking at the effect of values on science. We'll look at the questions of how should science be applied? So given some set of values, what should we be doing with our science and technology? So we'll look at genetic engineering, uh, which is sort of manip manipulating the uh, genome of living things, including ourselves. We'll look at geoengineering, which is the idea of uh, manipulating our own climate. We'll look at the ethics of AI, that is, what should we be doing with artificial intelligence? And finally, as a treat, we'll read uh, a couple chapters of Against Method by Paul Feyerabend, who is the most fun philosopher of science that I'm aware of. Uh, and he's going to argue that method is a kind of, scientific method is a kind of uh, ethical problem. He's a, he's an, a scientific anarchist. I, I just think he's super fun. So that's what we'll be finishing off with. So uh, those are the kind of big notions, the big ideas that we'll be dealing with the, this in this course. And uh, yeah, I hope you'll, I hope you'll find it interesting. Thanks. Thank you.